I don't know if I can live up to all this. I mean, I... <laughs> yeah, those were the days you were talking about Tony, and I'll just uh, elaborate a little on that. We had, um, I don't know, is the, is the mic on? Am I properly mic'd back there? You can hear? I understand they have a mic operator here, so if I say something they don't like, they can, <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> and there's a, somebody with a hook somewhere I know lurking, so I'll... Uh, Anyway, we had a technique in the company that our receptionist uh, understood from our teachings that when these uh, folks came in with, uh, say, a driver, or maybe they came by themselves with a leather-patched uh, tweed jacket, a woman or a man. We had a lot of horse people in those days. Highly a racetrack wasn't very far away. But our receptionist would have to observe something about the way the person was dressed and their demeanor as they came in. And remember, as you walked in, you won't remember, but I'll tell you, when you walk into our reception area, the whole wall was just covered with silver trophies, sterling silver trophies behind in a big glass case. So that's the start of the impression that this first time visitor might have when they arrive at the place. So they know they aren't there to buy vegetables. They know they're there for something that's pretty serious. And so the uh, receptionist would have to look at things like, jewelry or not, and the kind of shoes the person was wearing, what sort of shoes they had on, because they often would come from the track and not necessarily dress up, go to the track. If they had horses, they might have been down in the stable before they got to us. So um, Tony would get called when the right people were there. <laughs> and uh, he, Tony was a very even keeled guy. Everybody liked him. He had this wonderful Dutch accent, as uh, John pointed out. But a, Terrific knowledge. He was a grower at Thomas Young, and we, we attracted him to come to us uh, back about the time of the fifth world, no, the, in England. When, what was that? Third. Third. Third, third World Orchid Conference. He came to work for us at that time. Anyway, that, uh, the Tony history is an el interesting element. Uh, Tony has gone away now, and but uh, his legacy remains. Everybody remembers this wonderful, sweet man. Very knowledgeable in orchids. But today I'm going to talk about growers, not so much individuals, but growers as companies. In a couple of instances, we get down to specific people. But mostly it's about growers. And this little uh, fuzzy image in the front is sort of the feeling I got from the talk we had yesterday about white cats. It's sort of a fuzzy subject. And uh, we had our. <laughs> Jeff presenting us with all the history of the things in the past. Do you know what that is? It looks like Lucille Small. No, it's Tiff Tiffin Bells. Tiffin Bells. Bing! Yeah. <laughs> Next year you give a talk. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about highlights. This isn't about every grower that was breeding orchids. This is about those number of growers that I chose arbitrarily who um, had made hybrids, not by huge numbers necessarily, as you'll see, but by impact types, things that made a difference for people that were using cattleyas in a breeding program as a building block. And if they didn't do it themselves, did they leave something behind that we could use, the people that followed the earlier folks, that we could go on? And remember, Florida, Florida wasn't the only place, dealing with um, big cats, mostly big cats. Uh, we had a little bit of the old cut flower business that was still in Florida. And cut flowers were going away after the war. I mean, that, it got to the place where maybe in the early 50s it was okay that a woman might wear a corsage. And they, brought, they still brought good money and we sold plenty of them as cut flowers, whether they were fancy or not. But the demand was definitely going down. And um, the interest in better looking cut flowers, better cut flowers, was growing. Longer uh, peduncle or stem beneath the flowers so that you had room to cut and pack. So that was an important consideration in breeding. But in some of that breeding, we started to get some pretty good flowers. Improved cut flowers, I call it. So this, um, this first grower that I want to talk about, oh. First day, I'm sorry, this is, um, I need to give kudos and, and thanks to Bill Peters and his wife 
who uh, went down to the scene of Hurricane Andrew's um, uh, devastation on our nursery and started scooping up with nets and hand, hand picking uh, slides out of the water that was in the puddles. And that was our Abodia slide file with our thousands of slides. And so Bill had tried to rescue a lot of these and he spent hours and hours washing them with alcohol and scanning them and trying to improve and so forth. But as you can see, some of these, these are remnants that probably are as good as some of those that he was able to clean up. But, and you'll see some in the program. But thanks, Bill, to you and Carol for doing all that you did to give us some slides. All right, this company, um, Albertson Merkel, I see we're going to get some, some things are going to get pushed around here. I think I'm using a different program, a little different, a later version of PowerPoint, but we'll see. <coughs> Albertson Merkel uh, registered their first hybrid in 1940. That's why they're first on this list, and it's not alphabetical. But the Alberts family were in the cut flower business. That was out of Jacksonville, Florida. And the Merkel brothers were down in the West Palm Beach area. And they sort of married up and became Alberts and Merkel when the cut flower thing was going down and uh, became Alberts and Merkel down in Point Beach. The, um, the Merkel brothers were keen about not just orchids, but also foliage plants, especially Gene Merkel. So there was always this tension, I thought, in the company about which was going to take priority. Norman Merkel was the politician, and he was out front. He was president of the AOS at one point. And Gene was in the back, quiet, but this guy was a real horticulturist. He loved plants, and he loved doing interesting things and breeding, mostly other genera than cats. Maybe you'll remember Autumn Symphony. <clears throat> you will see, let's see here, if I can make this. Try to find a pointer. Oh, yeah, there we are. Okay. You see, um, right there is the number of hybrids that have been made with this Autumn Symphony, the number of progeny that have been made over some number of generations. The date on the image is the date that the hybrid was registered. And this will, I'll try to do that, I hope I did it consistently throughout. But this was the first attempt, I thought, that was worthwhile coming out of Florida that created um, what we call art shades to get these orangey colored flowers. Those weren't, in, those weren't common at all in the cut flower industry because what gal would want to put on a bronze colored flower? I mean, you need to have a WCL or big whites or big lavenders. That was cool, but not necessarily this one. So Medon, for which I don't have a slide, has behind it a certain um, breeding that you're going to see evidence of in the next couple of slides or a few slides forward. This, has, uh, this is Mrs. Mito, and the only slide I could find of Mrs. Mito <laughs> is a postage stamp but it has um, Cattleya iris behind it, and the problem with that is that it, uh, it causes crippling. And so the west coast of the United States has done a lot of breeding with meat on background, and we try to, um, we try to avoid that now, but they used it here with um, meat on, and this cut flower that I have not got an image of, and I haven't the slightest idea really of what it looked like, but it's, it was a cut flower variety, and they came up with Autumn Symphony that turned out to be very, Orchid Ranch was, what did I do here? Oh, there we go. My big fingers. Orchid Ranch was a guy by the name of Oscar Nelson. And Jones and Scully bought Orchid Ranch because it was contiguous to our property out at Miami International Airport. So we absorbed them about, I don't know, 19... 1960, more or less. And that, that put together the whole nursery property, which then was a little over 10 acres. And then that ultimately became Alamo Rent-A-Car, National Rent-A-Car. I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but hey, we put in the contract, they couldn't take down all those big, beautiful oaks we had. They knocked down the greenhouses, including that beautiful antique Lord and Burnham that came off the James Deering estate. But we made them right in the contract. They'd knock, not knock those big oaks down on one segment of the property. They're still there. 
they're still there. All right, so um, this um, Christ Merkel was an improved cut flower as far as I'm concerned. I mean, it, it didn't really recommend itself, but at that time it was definitely an improvement over what they were generally seeing. And the slide that I have available may not be the best. It's actually from Selby Gardens, but um, it had an AM registered in 1962. They realized that it was pretty good and they crossed it with Norman's Bay. This is a recovery slide too, I think. Yeah, it's got a crease in it. Uh, and Norman's Bay dressed it up pretty well and we got Norman Merkel. But the problem with that is that the Merkels didn't really have a, a strategy for developing cattleyas. I think they liked the Phalaenopsis things because the people in the Palm Beach area enjoyed having those things in their house, even in those days, lasting very long, get the camera in there and take a picture with a few orchids and these nice big sprays of Phalaenopsis. So they did pretty well with fails and didn't emphasize this. They also did not have a big lab program, which is a deficit for any company that's trying to grow a cattleya business. You've got to make flasks. You, can, you have to do it with fails too, but it's pretty quick with fails. With cats, it's a much longer and a bigger investment long term. They didn't do that. But they did come up with this one, um, which we all were just uh, stricken by when we saw it, just stricken with joy because it was a gorgeous, gorgeous red flower. Can you see that at that angle? Can you all see that okay with the angle? Anyway, it wasn't a very big flower, but uh, when we saw it at the South Florida Judging Center, not AOS, South Florida's own judging system. It, bingo, it got a, a gold medal. There are only about three or four clones of this that got awarded, but that was the one, that was the best one. It never was good enough to take to an AOS judging, they told me. I asked Gene many times about it, and he said, well, it just never flowers the right time. And the only thing that I can find that's come out of it that in recent times is this, boy, my pointer finger, this uh, Chinghua flame that came out of it when it was crossed with um, May Hawkins, Mia from uh, Hawaii. So the Merkels were interested in cats, and I think of cats as big cats, but you're going to see we're going to talk about some little cats. We heard some about yesterday little cats, small cats, mini cats they're called. And, um, it didn't just start. This started a long time ago. And one of the hybrids they made was red gold. Charles with I and Araniaca. And so red gold, which doesn't look all that startling, at least in this image, had 100, has 150 hybrids that have been registered, which include it in its progeny. I'm not talking about F1, but the whole continuum. Where it may be, in this case, I think five generations of red gold and you're going to see some hybrids from it, maybe right now. Let's see. Yeah. And uh, Chief and Jackie Bryce are here. And um, Herman, you, you made this hybrid, I think. And Barbara Wilkins registered it for you? Yeah, it's named for your beautiful daughter, Debbie. Debbie was our babysitter when we had the season tickets in 1972 to see the Dolphins' perfect season. <laughs> yes, yes. That was great. In any case, you probably recognize at least the middle one, which is uh, Gold Digger. Uh, that's not as well known, though, as uh, Orglades Mandarin, or I think the Fuchs Mandarin, or Fuchs Mandarin Gold. I've forgotten what he called that. But in any case, that is from Orchid Jungle. And I, you know, it's, it doesn't have our name on it, but I sure like that solid red lip. I think that's an absolutely stunning thing. And, um, Osmond, I think, made Red Imp. Bill Osmond, who was mostly in on Sydney and some epidendrums and cichlias out of the Bahamas and down that way, um, <clears throat> made Red Imp. So let's go to the Fennell Orchid Company. They first hybrid they registered was 49, and they registered a total of 302 hybrids. <clears throat> Again, not all cattleyas. But Tom Fennell Jr. was definitely interested in cats, mostly species. And uh, in the course of his, the little breeding they did um, with 
larger flowers and even the smaller ones, uh, one hybrid stands out, and it's really the one I want to feature for that company, Daffodil. I don't, do, you, do you know Daffodil? Any of you know this one? It only comes with uh, sometimes only one flower, but it might have as many as three. And uh, Tom made that hybrid, and look what's happened. Right now, at, we're out about six generations. We had 811 crosses that involve this in the background, and that's foundational. That's foundational because uh, here we took Glauca, which is a very short, compact plant, usually with a single flower, rarely with two, combine it with a randiaca, which is a taller plant, and we get daffodil, which is a taller plant. Really interesting, and then you can take that and go on to another generation. So I think I have a few slides or maybe some pictures of what has been done. These are all out of, these are all out of daffodil in a variety of generations. You can see the, the dates of registration. Did you know that this is hev it's heavily involved in this one? No. Doesn't look like it, does it? But it's in that lineage. So, you know, if you have a tool like the AOS program, um, which is a subscription program, or Orchid Wiz, a subscription program, those are tools we didn't have back in the day, if you will, and I wish we had, because I can remember laying out books on the table <laughs> and making these paper trees to show the lineages of all how, how we got to where we were going or how we might get to where we wanted to go. And it was very cumbersome. Now it's a couple clicks and bingo, you've got all this information, it's fabulous. I hope societies will have a common copy or something that you can use because it's so valuable and so interesting. You can learn so much. Then this outfit. That's the Mecca. Well, I don't know. What well, see, this is not your program. <laughs> You want to do one next year? You do one. <laughs> so they only, they only made 344 hybrids, but they were, these were cat people. They really were cat leaf people. And Governor Gore, governor of uh, Puerto Rico, had uh, a ton of money, and he was uh, interested in getting the best things he could find, and he mostly had to scavenge cut flower operators because in that era, again, that's, that's who the people were that had cats, yeah. He came to find his tree collection in the world. Ever assemble. That's yeah, correct. yeah. The finest tree on the collection ever assemble. Yeah, but we don't see those on the bench much anymore. They don't, uh, they don't show up, but they're in the background. And the good ones are the ones that have made great contributions, as you pointed out yesterday. They're critical to where we have gotten, and that's what we're talking about here is building blocks. Now those were species, uh, today I'm focusing on hybrids mostly, unless it's an um, introduction of a species that makes a huge turn, and you'll see some of those. So the Gore operation made a lot of hybrids, um, which got recognition at one time or another, but I had to pick out a couple that maybe were extraordinary in one way or another. And this, this one on the left, Twinkle Star, Boy, I'll tell you, when that thing came out, and the color that had, and the shape, uh, it, it was a stunner. That happens to be a variety of Texas. I don't know who the person is that owns it, but it must be an oil well owner. It was uh, Will Bates. Was it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, all right. But the um, people who converted this into something that we know more about today, how this little outfit that ended up well, they used to be by the airport, but then they ended up at Homestead. They bought a plant of Nigrella Jungle Princess from Nancy Ann Abbott in California. And uh, my dad happened to realize there might be potential there, so he bred Twinkle Star from Gore with Nigrella, which came from Nancy Ann Abbott. A hybrid, by the way, made maybe about, yeah, made in 1934, and I think it by Sanders. So it's ancient. Um, <clears throat> but he combined the two and he ended up with Cecile Simmons. And there were a whole string of awards for Cecile Simmons. And then it went away. Not much was done with it, <clears throat> which was a huge disappointment as far as I could see. But the plants were actually pretty good growers. 
And I think that was always a consideration in, in these hybrids and how good they might be for breeding onward. <coughs> Excuse me. Can I ask you a question? No. Questions are at the end. <laughs> we tried. Uh, <coughs> we tried, and we never were able to find the right combo. I think it can be done. Um, Dr. Sagawa thought it was a triploid, uh, but uh, we never did anything with it. Uh, these are all. Uh, these are out. These are out of the Gore operation. This one up on top, the Brandywine Orchid Glade, was the rage, and regrettably, it didn't breed well at all. I remember when I was at uh, UH, University of Hawaii. I met a guy by the name of Wallace Nakamoto, who was a collector of SLCs, and he had a piece of Anzac, uh, not Anzac, uh, Falcon. So we managed to, uh, I got some pollen from home, and we managed to make a seed pod on Wally's Falcon out in Hawaii and got seed. And we were growing the seed in his, in his house, and uh, things were coming up, all this green stuff, and it came time after I was graduated to come back home and I'm coddling these bottles and bringing them all the way back and then I cared for them for, it seemed like an eternity. They just wouldn't get out of a certain stage and they just kept making a cabbage like we saw yesterday in some of those uh, slides. They weren't just protocorms, they were undifferent, they were differentiated but going nowhere. Wouldn't make roots, we changed all the media, Sagawa was all over it trying to help us, it just wouldn't do. So Brandywine was a flop as far as a breeder is concerned. One club. Remember Frank Fordash is Pamela Martin. Well, that one outcome, <clears throat> which didn't go far either. Um, Ruth Whitbeck, the yellow that they had, well, that was pretty darn good for a yellow at the time. Um, having some ruffled petals and not being like um, Amber Glow or one of those uh, early ones, Dorset Gold. Those were just... Um, smallish flowers with lots of substance. Uh, the home run on this whole, well, there are two of them. The home run on this whole view is Dark Emperor. And if anybody has a color slide of that or an image of it, I'd love to have it. We, I can't find it anywhere, and it's... Um, what color is it? I beg your pardon? The, the color is it? What color is it? Uh, it's purple. I mean, pretty good purple. Not just the lavender. Yes, yeah. Um, Dark Emperor Black Waters, I think, was the really good one. That was from Trade Winds Orchids, Ken Little. Gables. Was it Gables? Well, that's another one. That's a separate one. That's the better one. I don't know. What do you think's better, Bill? Was it Dark Emperor Miami Shores? Well, he's the guy that used them. There were a lot of hybrids from fields that you'll see. <clears throat> but I don't, I don't remember at Ark Emperor Miami Shores, but it, it was really a critical uh, piece that came out, and then Osiris Miami Shores. Yeah. Osiris was made by the Gore people, and it is underappreciated by Cattleya breeders. It is just, it, it's a great breeder, it's a vigorous, powerful grower, makes tall, upright pseudobulbs and seven-inch flowers. So, and not a flower, two or three of these on a stem that mostly will hold up by itself. So it's a dreamy kind of a cat, sure. Is that, is that the virus that you're talking about right now? Mm -hmm. What? You're talking about Osiris. Yeah, we're talking about the lower, this one. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to confirm that. Yeah. So Osiris needs to be used more and um, which gives me a reason to comment that it's very difficult for an American breeder, Cattleya breeder, to produce plants here and grow a population. Uh, we recently heard that we may even have robots flipping burgers in the, in the fast food places. You start to raise the minimum wage and enforce it at some high level, you're going to take a lot of people out of work. And those are many of the people that can do really good work for a nursery room. It's, it doesn't require huge, huge skill, but they don't need to get $15 an hour, and they don't live by their own salary alone. They typically have people that are contributing so they can live somewhere. 
So I understand uh, the aspect of wanting to care about human beings and individuals, but we're driving this business of orchid growing, large plant size anyway, offshore. We can't afford to do it here. So that's a drawback for us. If you look at awards that are being given and new hybrids that are being developed, they're being developed in Asia. And also South America too, by the way, they are really coming along with some, they picked up many of our building blocks and they're doing wonderful things with it. But it's gonna be hard for American growers. I mentioned that to John the other day, how in the world can you, you've gotta build benches and pay electric bills and do all this stuff, it's tough. So now we'll go to another company, another Florida company, uh, earliest hybrid 1953, they didn't make very many. But I hope you'll agree by the time I've shown you a couple that what they produced was worthwhile. Excellency Orchid Glade. Now I was talking about Earl J. Small Company and here I show you a slide and some images of Excellency. The thing about those folks is that they, um, Mr. Small realized when he saw it that Excellency was a great flower. I know he didn't use Orchid Glade to make his hybrids but he did use Excellency, and, and he's the one that registered the cross that you'll see next, but these three images are Excellency Orchid Glade at different flowerings. This was one, an image that we made for our catalog in 59-60. That's a uh, flower on a plant that a friend in Sarasota is growing right now. It's not a really aggressive grower, kind of skin, uh, skinny bulbs, and narrow leaves. Uh, I'm sure that every piece of it, wherever it is, is virused, but should, be, um, should still be useful in breeding. And this upper left one, the, the frame around it, is the hybrid made by the small company that was really a breakthrough. When we saw that Judy Small Maydock, which is a hybrid of Excellency and Luella Parsons, that Just was- Just out of curiosity, how many of those did you make? Did you clone that? Uh, no. You didn't clone that? I don't think so. I think we bought plants from somebody that did. Oh, okay. Because you can't hardly find them anymore. No. I don't have it. Do you have it, Bill? Anybody know anyone that has Judy Small? Keith Davis I've got, does. I, I've got it. Have you? But I, you know, I'm always in with the backup pieces. Okay. Anyway, it, um, it turned out to be a breakthrough and gave people ideas. Uh, this, the pair on the right-hand side are Catlia Red Empress. That was a Jones and Scully hybrid, one we made using Excellency with uh, Bonanza. And those are big flowers, um, maybe a little bit floppy. They don't have real strong midribs, but those flowers, as you see in the photographs, are not groomed. So that's, the, that's what you get. And this one. Did you know that was a Florida, a Florida origin? This comes from Earl Small. And it is so important in, in our yellow breeding and now in the mini cat breeding. Uh, and then I think, Herman, your, your cross was with Bouton Dior, wasn't it? So, um, it's been used extensively. The good thing about it is it flowers floriferously. How about this little gem? This is a little pot plant display for a show. You just have to put some grass around it and let people ooh and ah over it. That's Bouton Dior. If I can interject, I remember going to one of the Miami shows. And you had a castration set up. And there was a line. And everybody in that line had at least two Bouton Dior's. Two heads of flowers on each plant. That lady was taking money just as fast as they could give it to us. Yeah. And you did, what, about $69 when you entered. Yeah, the early days, they were 70 bucks or so for, yeah, a, for a five-inch pot, and uh, they, they, were, they were blowing out. I mean, the interest in big cats uh, comes and goes. At the time of the WOC, I mean, I'll tell you, the big cats were, a bit, were significant. We had rows and rows of people, two registers running at our World Orca Conference booth, selling um, Mac Holmes, which is a hybrid from Carter and Holmes, uh, Norman's Bay background, and it, uh, most of the plants had two heads of flowers on them. 
and they were mostly selling for a hundred and a quarter and people would have them like this and check out and go put them away somewhere and come back. They persuaded a friend and they come back and we'd have to wait for the next shipment to come over from the nursery. We had benches of them. We had time for the, for the show. Bill, were you there then? I don't think you would. No, I was at Carter. You at Carter and Holmes. You hadn't come back yet. Anyway, there are a lot of good, oops, bad, uh, more Bhutan Dior hybrids that are more recent. Happy Face is, uh, I don't know, does that run over one another? I, I'm sorry, I think the software is different. Anyway, Orglade's Happy Face flowers on multiple leads, and it's got a very strong uh, influence of Bhutan Dior and actually Malworth. So we'll, we'll see some other examples of that. So the, uh, the Australians have made Burdekin Happy Face. Uh, this one below, Marv Reagan. And then um, Kroll's Happy Harold with um, Harold Smith. All look pretty good, but that's all out of the hybrid that was contributed for the building blocks by the people at Earl Small. And did you know they made that one too? Not that clone, but realize, you know, the hybrid was registered back in 1975. It's probably been made another hundred times from different parents everywhere. And I don't know where this hybrid, uh, this particular batch originated. Vi Galaxy, I believe, is Roy Oba's um, designation over in uh, Japan. But I put these three up there because um, I want to pointed out to the AOS judges or judges or everybody else. We always talk about, oh, I, you know, the spotting's irregular. Oh, this, this flower's different than that one. Well, these are, they look different. I think it's a mutation. <laughs> Bring it back next year when you grow it better. You, when you have spotted influence like this, it, it just isn't going to happen that you will every flower be exactly the same. The same is true in Phalaenopsis. And the most, um, well, Oncidiums, Catacetums. I can't tell you the number of times I've seen judges relatively, relatively new to judging look at a flower and say, you know, the, the spotting on this lip is so different from the spotting on this lip. There's something wrong here. I, I don't think we can judge this. So we have to um, take that into account. Have you ever heard that, Ken? No, I didn't blame you. And this guy, he, he's, he's quite a story. Uh, Roy Fields was a, he was a plasterer, a, a mason, a lath man, uh, and an orchid grower. He could talk. He could drink. He could smoke. I mean... Sundays for me often, uh, more often than I realized until I really thought about it, would be a trek from where we were living over by the Miami International Airport to drive up to Miami Shores and go see Uncle Roy. And uh, he would be there with maybe uh, Bill Shave. Sometimes you'd see um, uh, Hayden Sparks might go up. A couple of the medical doctors that were very keen and about orchids would go up. And they just sit around this big ceramic top table and talk about orchids. And they had two tiny little greenhouses there in the back of this very modest home in, in Miami Shores. And they would discuss what they were going to do, how, what might happen, how they could make these hybrids, or what would happen if they did it. Now, they had their books. They didn't have orchid with us. They just had the books, and they had the knowledge of all these guys. It was really inspirational. And I, I put this on the bottom here <clears throat> to call to attention this one, Phalaenopsis Zeta. There are about 7,000 hybrids with Zeta as a foundation. 7,000. Golden Sands. Well, that's that yellow Phalaenopsis that was such a breakthrough. Great stories about that. And Uncle Roy, I think there are upwards of three or four thousand that have that in the background and Miami made about another 1200 
So he wasn't just a cat man, but he, he had a great perception for what it took to make an outstanding uh, Cattleya hybrid. This one, uh, Marion Ryerson, that's trying to improve on an old cut flower, uh, Linnea Savage, which actually Roy made, I think. <coughs> Pardon me. With Hartland, that's from Europe. And he ended up with this um, Marion Ryerson. Pretty good for an improved cat. And then Zeta Fields, which is Dark Emperor, I don't have that slide, not a color slide, with Bonanza, there's a picture of Bonanza on the bottom. So we got these lavender cats at work. Cornucopia is one of the best Bonanzas, I think. And then we use more Dark Emperor and we get Maddie Shave made in 1968 and 112 different hybrids. Did you know the king of Taiwan, that monster, is built on Matty Shave? Or Okartu, which is famous in Japan as a great parent, built on Matty Shave? Yes, Matty Shave produced a lot of dark. Yes. A lot of dark flowers. Yeah. And this one, um, I mentioned he did fails and cats and some other things, but Keith Roth, did you know that Roy Fields made Keith Roth? And Keith Roth became the foundation for so many of our Cattleyatonias, or now we have all kinds of different names for that combination, but um, so important in, in things that we have bred since. There in the middle that we were talking about yesterday, Brigari, Cattleya Brigari, or Lelia Brigari. You can see what happened when he did that. We got flying colors out of um, Carter and Holmes. And then another grower, an individual down in South Florida, produced uh, Roy Fields. So there, there is a key series of um, building blocks that came out of Miami Shores. And both of these were from the Fields vision. Ethel McBroom, uh, more, more recent, and Osiris Bay hasn't been used very much, and I think the opportunities are just great. It's a powerful plant and a very good grower, good flowers, carrying three on one stem here, and those, <coughs> pardon me, these are all... Who owns yeah. Duke? Pardon me? Who owns Duke? I've never heard of that variety. I, I don't know. I, I found it in uh, research, and I haven't been able to track down. I saw it in some generic slide albums, wow. so I'd have to do some research. Well, does the, does the AOS uh, program tell you who the exhibitor was? Well, I don't think I looked in the AOS program. Uh, that's not my first reference point. And I should have gone on and looked. <laughs> yeah. It is, it's uh, only partially complete. Sometimes they won't tell you who the exhibitor is or anything about the measurements. You might get a date, and that's about it. So it's uh, a lot of key punch work that needs to be done. They're looking for volunteers. Actually, Laura Newton is putting yes. Say what? Laura Newton is putting the old information. Oh, she's putting it in? She's going back. Great. Yeah. Great. So this guy, William Miles, out of uh, Central Florida. Um, ever heard of him? Anybody heard of William Miles? Miles. Nobody heard of him. Yeah. Well, we got a couple. He, um, he was an interesting guy, big tall fellow, white hair when I knew him. I only met the man when he was probably in his, maybe my age. But he had a perception about breeding cats and he loved to travel around and talk and chat with people, very personable kind of a guy. But uh, he made some interesting things. And this RLC Maitland Miles, BLC Maitland Miles, is a tremendous building block. I forgot to frame this, but this is Maitland Miles right here. And I wish I had made a slide to pop this out, but this is one of the parents, Lee Langford Copper Queen. And I suppose I could look hard enough and find a better slide of Lee Langford. But I wanted to use this, and I use it again to make the point that I started talking about. As soon as you use Mrs. Mito in the background, you're going to get this kind of uh, progeny 
at least three or four generations out where you get periodic crippling or striping on the, on the flower parts, the sepals and the petals. I mean, I would no more think about using that for a parent than the man on the moon. And that's not virus, by the way. No, no, it's uh, genetic. They used to call it's it a <clears throat> cripple. Yeah. <laughs> but the outcome is beautiful, Maitland Miles. So um, it's been, it appears in 279 lineages of our modern day hybrids. You know, the uh, Chinese or the Orientals are using, you know, that's the background of every yellow they've got. Well, have a look at that. How about that? Yeah, I see that. That's from Maitland Miles. And how many haven't heard of Chia Lin? You know about Chia Lin. Everybody knows about that, right? I happen to have been at the um, Japan uh, conference, oh, the JGP, Japan Grand Prix, about, uh, I don't know, maybe it was, it might have been around 2000, 2001, it was the early part. In any case, it won grand champion. And along with it, I think it got, they got $50,000 and a Mercedes. So this was a, this was a big deal. And this Taiwanese fella had brought it over, but he brought it over all groomed up with a wire all around the back and cellophane holding the sepals and petals where they, really need to be to have a perfect flower. And we were just uh, shaken by the fact that he could even enter the plant for the competition, never mind win these big prizes and big money, because this was just anathema to those of us who are purists in terms of how what you can do to bring a plant before the judges. Well, we got overridden. Uh, those of us who objected, all the American judges that were there were just, you can't do this. We were overridden, the guy wins the trophy. They put it up on a, they put the trophy and all the winning plants all around this big um, promenade in the middle of the place so that everybody can see it and take pictures, perfect background and all that. And there it sat uh, with its major trophy. Two days later, the petals are all drooping and <laughs> bruised. Now this show is gonna go for 10 days. So there was an outright panic. Well, the guy said, no problem. He called his father. His father came overnight from Taiwan and brought another one. <laughs> All wrapped up again. But this one lasted through the end of the conference. But it did cause a bruja and it called to attention the reality that in other parts of the world they do things a lot differently uh, before judges. So we need to think about that when we're considering the awards and uh, points that you see after them. If they can groom plants like that, I mean, why can't you get a perfectly flat semi-alba with a gorgeous round or square lip? It's just, uh, it's a different world. But you can flower this one all on your own, right here, they're all over the place, Chilin, New City, and they're absolutely gorgeous. And they come out of Mr. Miles' uh, beautiful hybrid, Maitland. And these are all the kids, some kids, it came from 122 times it's been used at F1, just at F1, two generations since it was introduced. And it's going to be a biggie coming from Central Florida. I beg your pardon? Um, Bloom's Nursery down in Fort Lauderdale. The earliest hybrid in 62, he only made 22, that only registered 22. And here is um, the upper left is uh, war paint. The war paint. <laughs> How about that? And war paint appears in the background of so many things. 155 as of now. Um, one of the things that came out of it is Gold Digger. There are 121 behind it now. You saw Gold Digger much earlier. I showed you the one from Orca Jungle with a red lip. Um, this one is, uh, happens to be Orglades Mandarin, the one in the uh, middle top. And then this one, this one and the one above are all have um, Epidendrum stem 40 anum in them. And they cause that very curious speckling. Make a nice head of flowers. The name of the one on the right, upper right? No, I said questions at the end. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't remember. I have to look. We'll look at it. We'll look at it. 
I'm sorry, you got me. <laughs> One I didn't know. <laughs> I had half of it. I know I have half right. But it's got war paint in it. I don't know whether there's anything in between. I just don't know the name. So it's war paint and stamp 40 anum. So if you want to look it up on your phone, go ahead. But you know, might get demerits. I beg your pardon? Oh, is that the name of it? Okay. All right. So here is another one from Mr. Bloom. Anybody heard of Royal Emperor? That's, that's Mr. Bloom. So this is a small nursery guy who's got a few plants and takes a chance and makes some combination that other people might not have thought of. So he combined that stripy Lee Langford. What do you call it, Jeff? Cripple Queen? Cripple. See this one on top, Cripple Queen, with uh, Dark Emperor, which is a dark, dark lavender flower, Black Caesar, and made Royal Emperor. Well, there are 264 offspring which have that now in the background or as of the last updates. Bob, before you go on, did you ever go to his backyard? Did I do what? Where his plants were? In Bloom's place? Yeah. Yep. You remember some big animals he had? Yeah. That is an interesting guy. Very interesting guy. So here is some offspring from Royal Emperor. Uh, on the right, Orglades Charm, that's a hybrid that uh, we made, but Frank Smith uh, got an award on his variety, Christel. In fact, there's another one, I think. It costs with Eva Marie Barnett, we get Aaron Red, that's fairly recent. I should have put the dates on here. Tainan City, that's also fairly recent with uh, Wine Eye Sunset. But it's a, uh, it's a tremendous parent. It doesn't seem to carry the crippling, at least into the next generation, and appears this one on the bottom, uh, Tainan City, is uh, uh, no, it's second generation. So I, I don't know how far it's going to go without the crippling. Could show up again. And this fella made a couple of different things that were interesting, but I picked one because I think uh, you probably know about it. Mildred Reeves, this happens to be uh, Mildred Reeves Orchid Glade that's framed on the top, and that's a rescue slide. Thank you, Bill, for cleaning that up and making it possible to at least see that. Uh, these other couple I got from, I think, AOS or, but there are probably a half a dozen different clones of Mildred Reeves that have been made, um, that have been recognized, awarded, and they breed wonderfully. So I expect we'll, um, well, there we have up on the upper right a little summary, 40 awarded Grexus and clones in just two generations. So talk about a semi-alba. It's a very good grower in terms of making pseudobulbs. I wish the plant were taller and more erect. The bulbs don't seem to be as strong as, as I would like to see them, but it's a reliable bloomer and two to three flowers on, per inflorescence. But here are some of the first generation kids. Uh, Orglades Grand, uh, Orglades Ruffles and Discovery. Maybe you can see you might remember Red Empress. That came out of the Excellency line with a big, almost floppy looking petals, the dark color and variation in the tones. Quite nice. And then this bunch. <laughs> they, um, they quit registering hybrids, but they made 630 before they did that. And we have a few. and I. The, um, this is toward the end uh, of the program, and I don't want to blow a lot of heat about this, but I'll show you a few things that seem to have been helpful to people that are in the breeding business. We heard yesterday about Breegerai. Um, my dad got the first plants of Breegerai that I know were in the country from uh, Jorge Brabunin. Uh, Francisco and I were talking about this the other day, that. He was a very reliable supplier, and the plants came in clean. We never had problems with the customs or agriculture people. But he had found a um, population of this Brigeri, which was just not in cultivation up here. So um, uh, Dad was able to get a good one, particularly good uh, colored lip one. And in 1981, we made Orglades Early Harvest. 
Uh, the Japanese went crazy over it. They bought everything we had at the time. I mean, it was practically gone overnight. Uh, we did clone it. They were gone. But the hybrid with uh, Hazel Boyd was an instant success. The plants got to be a little bigger than the mini cat folks would like, I think, but a, a little bit taller. But they made a nice tall inflorescence with these beautiful uh, flowers. That variety, Magic, was, was not ours, but was awarded. Uh, this one is another Brigerai hybrid that Milton Carpenter made. Well, maybe Andy Easton, I'm not sure, but. Milton made it. Milton made it? Yeah. Okay. Um, but anyway, Barefoot Mailman, Brigerai, and Mad Fordyce. Mad Fordyce was all the rage, the rich color, beautiful color. Yeah. Oh, stuff like that happens. What a shame. That's great. Well, in any case, the outcome was nice. So Brigerai is not a very big flower, as we heard yesterday, but it does, uh, it does grow well, and it's, uh, shall we say, heat tolerant. So it does not create a problem for us to grow here in, in South Florida. And then the Japanese made this hybrid with Bhutan Dior. Brigerai and Bhutan Dior. <coughs> oh, back up. So this was a breakthrough. As I mentioned we might show a couple species. The Brigerai was the first one. Here's another one. Uh, Walker Anna Alba Orchid Glade. There are all kinds of tales about this. Now we're not talking about pendentive here. We're talking about Orchid Glade. That's another controversy which I could address, but uh, for the moment, let's talk about this one. The controversy here is that uh, I learned about five or six years, no, maybe it's a little longer ago, somebody said this was a plant that we got from a guy who had swiped it out of the National Botanical Garden in Brazil. Uh, I, you know, I don't have any way to talk to my dad about it. I know, I know the man that gave it to us, and as far as I know, we never had any kind of an experience which suggests that the guy was disreputable. But it did provide us a leap into a future of using uh, white uh, Cattleya walkeriana for, for breeding. That was the first walkeriana awarded too, wasn't it? Um, it did get an FCC, but I, I don't, there were other walkerianas, darker ones maybe. First, one <clears throat> first white one was awarded, yeah. So we made uh, Angel Walker. Uh, Angel Walker is that white, um, this is somebody else's photograph here. That's a pretty good image of Orchid Glade. Um, but we crossed it with Little Angel, which, as I mentioned to you, Jeff, yesterday, was made by JNS. Registered uh, 1,284 progeny. We registered in 1959. So I don't know, the folks gave you some info on that. But Angel Walker has now been used, uh, made in 69, it's been used 1,047 times as of the last update. It's in the heritage of 1,047 hybrids. That doesn't mean F1, it's all the generations. It might be four in this case. And we saw an example uh, yesterday, Cherry Chip was, is being used now by um, mini cat breeders. Uh, there you have it on the, uh, on the upper part, uh, Little Dipper, which I call Orglade Smooch, yeah. and properly uh, understood to be the, the lips of the person appreciating this beautiful little flower. That plant's a pretty good, I beg your pardon? How many of those did you plant? We never made, in, this, in the early stages, we never made more than about 500. And that was because uh, the the concern at the time about mutation. We were just getting started with cloning. And um, it, was a, it was a worry about trying to make too many at one time. Now, of course, uh, the next problem is that somebody takes a clone of that and clones it. And then you have another set of worries to whether you're going to get a consistent reproduction in that next generation. I blew mine uh, here just a few weeks ago. Yeah, mine too. I had two heads of flowers on it. <clears throat> Here's another Brigerai hybrid with Angel Walker. 
autumn, or glades, autumn glow, or, or glades glow. Yeah, glow. And here's one that um, we, have, we never made much of. This came toward the end of our life, if you will. So we didn't use it much, but there's a fellow down in Brazil that has discovered it's a great parent. And so far, just that guy has registered 25 hybrids that are getting recognition in Brazil. It's a monster out of uh, Tiffin Bells that Jeff talked about yesterday and Pastor Al, which was made by Altenberg down in Brazil. So uh, that is an interesting um, avenue to get something that might be like a Mount Hood, but a, a little less influence maybe than, uh, than what we have from Mount Hood, Matt Anderson, and that whole crew. The Tiffin Bell's Orchid Glade, and I know it says Orchid Glade on it, but I want to criticize it because as a parent, um, it's always troubling to me to think about how the flowers are going to, not troubling, challenging to think about, something I have to think about if I'm a breeder. How are the flowers going to display themselves? These things have a very short peduncle. So the flowers are always crowded. And we saw in a plant a hybrid of Tiffin Bells yesterday that Jeff showed us that he enjoyed very much. And it must be beautiful, but you could see the flowers were all congested. You, can, you, you get a mass. These aren't peonies, these are orchids. You, know, you should be able to see them. So um, I think it, uh, it needs to go a couple generations out and people need to work on getting a longer peduncle and a taller stem so you have less crowding on the, uh, on the inflorescence. Um, a few more here. This is uh, a hybrid that we made a name for a prominent guy in Vietnam back in the war years, um, Dinh Thu Yen, uh, across here. And that, that hasn't been used enough. It's got 46, uh, it appears in 46 progenies, but the, it just has not been used enough. It's terrific. Very good grower. And then, of course, this one, Malworth, lots of controversy with it. Um, <clears throat> I guess it, right now it's in 342 registrations, uh, in the lineage of 342. And I put two pictures up here, um, different flowerings, obviously. The one on the left is a picture I got from Bill Peters. And the one on the right is a picture I made of a plant I flowered at home. Uh, they, they do have some variation, and the color variation has to do not just with the photographer's lighting, but also with the age of the flower. So um, instead of getting uh, sorry looking as it gets older, it looks better as it gets older. The color improves. You get rid of the white striping, which is um, a little bit conspicuous on the one that's taken in that orchid show exhibit. And this is Lorraine Malworth, Malworth and Lorraine Shirai. And I show you two of the same clone and then another of a different clone. And you can see that white striping. Unfortunately, in Lorraine Malworth, it doesn't seem to go away. But this clone, which I think is Orlando, um, that one does not have the white midribs. It doesn't get the light colored midribs. It hasn't been used enough in breeding to say that it's going to be forever that way. But uh, the, the plant on the right, Orlando, I think that grows better than Orchid Glade. So if I were going to do any breeding, I would want to try to use that one. Was that uh, Lorraine Shiraz St. Petersburg that you used? As the I think so. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. It's yeah. because that's the only one that doesn't cripple. Yeah, I think so. Malworth, Malworth's so powerful. Um, and then we made this hybrid with Bhutan Dior uh, that we've seen a picture of earlier. And this is a little display or a photograph I made of a plant in my own collection. And just telling you that we have one dose of Malworth, uh, one dose of Bhutan Dior, three times Malworth in this, one chance of Medon. Medon is the one that has the crippler background, but it's buried by Malworth and Lorraine Shirai. And um, that's probably St. Pete, too. That goes, back, um, that goes back a ways. But Happy Face is a wonderful plant and should be used in breeding because it's such a good grower and flowers on multiple leaves sim simultaneously. Bless you.
And then this one that uh, I have heard Jeff say before, it's too bad it's just never gotten recognition. And I, I think so too, but it's, uh, it's beautiful. It's a hybrid of Malworth and Waikiki Sunset, but I mean, look, look at these ends here. I mean, that, that's got to, that hurts. There's another one. This is one flowering at home, and then the one on the right's another flowering. Um, yeah, you sold some pictures of those, because I bought five of them. Yeah, we did have some. We did have some. Unbelievable to grow, too. But they're, they grow pretty well. No, I beg your pardon? Most intense orange. Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. Not a very big flower, but it's uh, leather-like, long-lasting, and extremely fragrant, a wonderful fragrance. So I can bring it in the kitchen and leave it there for a week or, I mean, uh, a month or five weeks, and it'll be in good shape. Lasts a long time. Sorry? Who has it? Yeah, it's around. He has some. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a little bit more. I, I think the people in Japan have, uh, have taken on um, reading with Malworth and doing things in the Malworth line, which are pretty interesting. Uh, this, this one in the middle I'll call because I just criticized uh, Lorraine Malworth. This is a descendant of Lorraine Malworth. But so they got rid of the uh, white stripes in the midline, and that's, that's really a beautiful bloom. All of these, by the way, have a wonderful fragrance. I failed to mention that as I went through, but uh, these yellows are just terrific. And now we're back to um, our friend Osiris, uh, Miami Shores, and what it can do. So uh, my dad was able to get a plant of Sylvia Fry Supreme. I think it was the first one that came to the U.S. out of Australia. And it was used as a parent with Osiris to make Orglades Full House, and these are monsters about seven inches, six and a half, seven inches. You get two flowers on there, fragrant, long-lasting, wonderful grower, all the criteria you'd want for a breeding parent. And um, it, it came about, again, toward the end of our existence, so uh, we didn't really get a chance to exploit it, but it is a, um, a beautiful variety. There's Tipperary and Orchid Glade, both have AMs. Tipperary was the name of my dad's estate. And you both of those? Sorry? Did you both of those? No. Neither. 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 We never offered that. I mean, we, we had it on our list to do, but uh, time. Do you have it here for the You mean I got to pay for my hotel room now? <laughs> I just, I've looked for that for years. I've never had found it yet. Oh, I you got to get a drone, brother. <laughs> yes. Where did the flares come from? Well, it's, uh, it's interesting. I think it comes out of the Osiris. I think because you can get little uh, tips of color on the Osiris. You see it has a streak? Yeah. But both Archigladen and Tipperary have um, a little intensity in the center. But it's a lot better than the white. And I don't think it really detracts at all. Well, I, I mean, I could go on and on, particularly with Norman's Bay breeding, things that we did over there, but uh, I won't because I'm afraid, you know, a lot of people are going to want to leave. So in any case. <laughs> So you have a question, John? <laughs> you don't want it. Could you tell us about Wakriana alba pendentum? Yes. Here we oh. go. That's the best one. Thank you. I've never, I, I, I need to hear the story once. The real story. The real story. The real story. Yeah. The real story. Yeah. And I'll ask the other controversy. The, um, the, the real story about pendentive, its origin, its origin, which is what has caused the controversy, and could it be a man-made hybrid or some kind of uh, misrepresentation? It's always a misrepresentation that's insinuated. The reality is that a um, guy who is now a retired priest, um, Father Mark Reeves, 
uh, started growing orchids when he was so big. And he used to be at our nursery and Warren Kelly's place, Orchid World International eventually, but down in Miami. And he, he would come, his mom would bring him on the weekends, and he just loved orchids. And Mark became one of the youngest judges. I think maybe he was a little bit older than I. I might still be the youngest that ever became a judge. But Mark was young and early a judge. And he was so intense in his orchids, and there were people trying to encourage him, just like we try to encourage this young man that we've had with us for several years now. And um, a fellow by the name of Andy Jackson, who is an orchid uh, lover down in Coconut Grove, was bringing plants in from Brazil and looking at those ads. If you look back in the old AOS bulletins, you'll see ads from these guys that would sell you a sack of plants for so much money from Brazil. This was pre cites so you would pay your money, send your money down there, and boom, up comes a bag of plants, maybe in a box, but essentially a sack of plants. It was a grab bag. I think they called it grab bag. And this Andy Jackson took some plants out of that one of those bags and gave Mark Reeves that plant and others. Of course, there's no flowers on them. These are just plants that have been collected in the wild in Brazil and are part of this grab bag. And Mark got that plant out of that sack. And I have confirmed that with him more than once because every time I tell the story, somebody else tells me that my story isn't right. I go back to the guy who got the plant. He has no reason to misrepresent what that plant is or where it came from. Herman and Jackie, you knew Mark, didn't you? Didn't, when he was down at uh, Kelly's a lot? So, uh, you know, I believe this is absolutely what happened. Now, to go beyond that, because there's so much controversy, the Japanese, who are very keen, they have separate societies for Walkeriana, Nobelia, and some of these specialty species. They, uh, the Walkeriana group went to the trouble of having a um, um, cladogram. Pardon me? Genetic profile. Yeah, they did, a, they did cladograms and figured out what, how this might fit into what they had decided was a pure Walkeriana. And Ken, I believe you've seen the paper, or maybe even, no, okay, you have the paper. And so it shows that this pendentif falls right in the middle of the Walkeriana profile. Yeah. So there is no nonsense here, and it's been proven scientifically, and still people want to create a controversy over it. It's wrong. It's Walkeriana until somebody, if we want to accept the science that comes from DNA analysis and we are changing all the names of these plants because the DNA boys are prevailing, then we're going to accept Walkeriana as the identity of Walkeriana pendentive. Got it? Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. We mean, where, where did all those people yeah, get I, me? Yeah, the, the, you got these slides from these people or a collection. Well, you know, most, most of that uh, has been uh, facilitated by use of the Internet. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, many of these people are, they may be bloggers or they may be contributors to Orchid Wiz or they may be individuals that I have prevailed upon. Alan Backrock used to come to this meeting in the first couple of years, but he's a great Catlia grower up in Nashville. I mean, uh, these are all Catlia lovers. Jim Roberts is over in Sarasota. Gene Crocker we saw last year. So, that, you know, you just, um, you can borrow them. I used to have zillions of slides, and that's the one, those are the ones we uh, would like to have, but I don't have them. So the, the, the slide or the dispersant is the plant, however. Yes, um, I mean, they're protected in some ways uh, for copyright. And um, this is an educational event, so you get no resistance from people to borrow from the AOS or borrow from Orchid Wiz or any of these individuals. Uh, you know, the, the pay that John's given me is so uh, inspirational. <laughs> We, we need that because uh, you weren't there. Right. That's right. And I wasn't always there. But it helps us to be able to put things together, which was the purpose of this particular discussion, to talk about these foundation, foundational elements and realize it's not about California, or it's certainly not about Taiwan. It's definitely not Japan or Thailand or Malaysia or any place, South America. 
It's about us, what we did here in Florida. There are other contributors that I could highlight, but they didn't make building blocks like those that I demonstrated. And I think that's what, that was my objective, and I hope I've been able to leave you with a little bit of uh, helpful information to appreciate just how important Florida breeders have been to the overall of Cattleya production as we know it today. Yeah. The other controversy, the person that should be here missed his plane. Densmore Perfection. I mean, Keith Davis? Oh, no. No. Another friend of ours, David Off. Densmore Perfection to this day, if you go to the RHS website, registration, only one parent is listed. The other parent is missing. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, would you explain to these people that that happened first, and would you give your interpretation <coughs> of why it only has one parent to dispel 60 years worth of gossip? Well, we don't, e <laughs> we don't even have to use uh, Dinsmore. I mean, if you go to Sanders, the hard copy, or go to Orchid Wiz or the AOS program and start looking through many of the old, old hybrids, foundational hybrids for the cut flower business, you find many of them that have one parent unknown. IGN. It just some, of, some, of the, the parents, some there were a few that had neither, but this was not uncommon as we got started in registering hybrids and getting a beginning point. We had this beautiful flower. We know it has this one side. What was it, Schroeder? I think. Or, so we have this one parent. We know it's that. We don't know exactly what the other one is, but shouldn't we register this because people are going to breed with it? And at least we know that the beginning point was this. And I think that uh, that's not all bad. I know that when we talk about hybrids, I don't hear any of you talking to me about three generations back. I hear Jeff talking about this is a DS hybrid. Well, that's the beginning point then for your reference, DS or Bobels. We ought to be thinking about blocks of uh, background what got to Bobell's? That's our beginning point. So let's talk about it being a Bobell's hybrid. And, and, and that's how I think they thought about it when they started out. We need to make a record of this beginning point. And hereafter, when somebody makes a submission using this, it'll have unknown there, but we'll know the parents on the, on the addition that's been made in the new hybrid. Isn't that so the way they... Yeah. They can't do it. Neither, neither can camellias, and they can't tell you whether they use disbudded ones or, or how they made it when they did the. Uh, it's, uh, we, have, we have pretty good records, so this worry about using IGN is, should not be a worry. What about Maribor? What about it? Yes. What do you want to know? You remember Joe Redlinger? I know Joe Redlinger. Hazel Bridges again. Well, um, did you know Joe Redlinger? I know Joe very well. And uh, Joe, um, Joe is often in another world. Yes. <laughs> he was often in another world. And by the way, I guess the way, the best way to treat this would be to see the slides of all the awarded Malworth clones, not just Malworth Orchid Glade, because we had New Gold, we had Miami. Uh, we had, um, five yeah, 5WOC. They all look different, and some of them are very squeezy-looking things. You wouldn't think about giving them an award today. How many are there, Bill? There are only four or five? At least six or seven. Okay. But they're different. That's the only one that looks like that. Do I know the parents? I gave, I gave you the slide. But see, the... The, the question really is about what happens in the genetics, and you know, the, uh, there had been a suggestion that Jones and Scully had a mixed up toothpick, and they crossed Charles with I with, uh, or Malvern with Joyce Hannington, for example. I mean, these are silly arguments. The plants don't even grow like that. 
you have to look at the plant at the same time you make this sort of uh, analysis, and certainly before you speak. And that's the problem that a lot of people have had about criticizing the hybrid that was made by my dad probably about 19, I don't know, maybe around 1958 or something like that. I think it was registered in 63. So um, it's, that's an argument that's been going on forever. We showed you a slide today of um, Tom Fennell's Charles with I Horizon. Which is a sieve. Yeah, and it, um, Tom had no problem at all with the malwork because he knew Charles with I and the variation that could exist within it. And whether you're going to get squeezy little flowers out of the outcome of every hybrid you make with that is doubtful. I mean, let's use the uh, Albertson Merkel hybrid of red gold. And we cross red gold with, um, what was it? Um, not chit chat. Um, war paint. Cross it with war paint. We don't, we get full flowers. And you got that squeezy little thing that came out of a Randiaca and you get a round flower. A war paint's not exactly round either. So um, genetics play a big role here, and it's not single factor. It's typically multiple factor, not just one gene for yellow. Gene for yellow is the genes for yellow are probably three to five. And the same thing for red, red. Those are multiple genes. We're going to hear, I hope, from Roy. He's going to tell us about uh, genetics and ploidy and so forth. So uh, I better get off of here before I get the hook. But I hope that they... <laughs> That gives you some idea. I look forward to hearing from Roy. Thank you.